Exactly according to your research, what have been the consequences of smoking, particularly smoking among the younger generation, younger men? I understand your research is mainly about uh, their health. Well, in China now, the people who start smoking start smoking when they're young. And if you start smoking when you're young and you keep smoking, then there's about a 50% chance that it will kill you. So half of all the young smokers who start in early adult life and keep smoking will be killed by it. And that is what the men in China are doing now. At the moment, the women smoke much less, but the Western experience is that if a lot of the young men smoke, then eventually a lot of the young women will smoke. But for the moment in China, it's mainly the men who have started to smoke, so it is mainly the men who are being killed by tobacco. Mm. If you have two-thirds of the young men in China start to smoke, keep on smoking, and half are killed by it, that means that about one-third of all the young men in China will get killed by smoking mm. if they continue. I suppose the good news is that if you stop, if you stop before you're 30, even if you stop before you're 40, you'll avoid most of the risk. But if right. you stop before you're 30, you'll avoid 97% of the risk. So smoking kills, but stopping works. And we are seeing in China now, which we weren't seeing 20 years ago, we are seeing that some people are stopping and staying right. stopped. Okay, let's ask the, how they have stopped and whether they can really stop it. Uh, Dr. Pratt. I understand you and Dr. Tang are all very strong advocates of no tobacco in China. But let's just be a little bit realistic and pragmatic here. So let me ask you the question. What exactly are the policies of anti-tobacco now in China? Have they really been working since they were being brought up last year, 2015? Well, the smoke-free law that we've seen introduced in Beijing over the last 12 months tomorrow, in fact, is the one-year anniversary of that law. It is working. We're seeing that with a strong enforcement effort, compliance rates are very good. Restaurants, for example, the, the percentage of restaurants where people are smoking has decreased from around 40 per cent to around 15 per cent. 15 per cent is, of course, still too many, but uh, that trend is absolutely moving in the right direction. Mm. The law is very popular. People like it. And the reason people like it is because the majority of people are non-smokers who don't want to go out to public places, who don't want to go to work, to the well, office, and breathe the secondhand smoke of others. I, I, and we're I, I, also I, seeing that uh, that smokers are quitting. Uh, people are thinking about quitting and smokers are starting to quit. So we still have a very long way to go, but it is working. We and we and we, who are the we you are talking about? Uh, you talk about certain statistics and the decreasing of desire to smoke and even of that smoking phenomenon in public places. But it seems that in big cities, it is still a very, very popular phenomenon. I don't know which restaurants you visit, but certainly many of the restaurants that I visited and many of my colleagues as well are still not necessarily free from smoking. Uh, even though there is very clear signs of it. So are we, are we being a little bit self-congratulatory already one year after the policy was being put out? It's absolutely, we shouldn't be self-congratulatory. And the reason we shouldn't be self-congratulatory is because there's still a very long way to go. There are, of course, there are still challenges. Beijing is a very big city. There are four million smokers here in Beijing not alone. Not only Beijing. No, uh, not only in Beijing. Many of the other mega cities, not to even mention middle and small sized cities. So that's what are the policies, right. uh, according to you, that can be working and should be working? Well, the policies that, that we know work are smoke-free public places, as I said, making public places is smoke-free. Beijing is off to a great start, but we need a national smoke-free law. Who's we going need... to monitor that? Well, and who have already monitored that? Well, the WHO monitors these things Can you very really carefully. monitor all of these places around China? We, we monitor these things very carefully. We monitor these things very carefully. In addition to smoke-free public places, we need policies like making tobacco more expensive, less affordable through increasing taxes, uh, banning advertising, promotion, sponsorship of tobacco. Uh, and of course, we also need uh, to provide help to those smokers who need assistance to quit. There are 315 million smokers in China. Some of them want to quit, but they need help to do so, and we should be looking at, at providing ways to do that. Mm -hmm. Dr. Tang, help us to understand this. Um, many of the places that we have seen practicing or adopting anti-smoking policies have been having bigger wills than their actions. Mm -hmm. uh, 
this is not just in China, but yeah. also inside the European countries, in some states of the United States as Could well. Could I just comment from England on this question? Uh, may I just ask you later? Could I, I need from to England have, on this question? May I, may I just ask you oh, a little please. bit later? Yeah, because uh, yes, I need to address do. this to uh, Mr. Chang so that everybody can have a chance to speak as well during please. this panel. Yes. So, Mr. Chang, uh, have Ch has China really done it? I mean, one year after it. I would say uh, the results are mixed. Uh, they are improvements for sure. Nevertheless, you look at statistics, you know that the places, for, for example, the uh, internet bars, office buildings, medical facilities, uh, including some high school and um, university campuses, their enforcement is the weakest, which is not a good news. Mm -hmm. For example, the re reporting system, they call the five number, magic number, you couldn't get through. Uh, they should change a strategy by taking a picture of it and uh, uses two-dimensional code and report to the uh, reporting center so they can go after the restaurant owners afterwards. Mm. So we have to improve the method of uh, supervision, reporting, and make it work. For yes. example, I go to restaurant very often myself. I can see people smoking, not that many, but still there. Nobody stopped them. When I step up and say stop, they stop. But you cannot depend on individuals to do this by himself. So right. there's a long way to go, but it's a good start. Mm. Beijing should do a good job as a, as a demonstration, as a model for the whole country to follow, but it's a long way to go. Uh, well, let's have uh, Sir Petal. I, I know you have something to say, Sir Petal. Well, it's just that when you say, is it working, you've got to actually take a fairly long time scale. Um, in Britain, if you go back 40 years, half of all the male deaths in middle age were caused by smoking. Now, the risk is only one quarter as big. There's been a huge decrease in cigarette consumption. There's been a huge decrease in tobacco deaths. Mm. But that's over a 40 year period. Now it would be better to do things faster than that. But in China, you're running at a million deaths a year now. You'll have two million deaths a year in the 2030s if you keep on the way you are. And then right. round about three million deaths a year from tobacco in the middle of the century. We're talking in total about something like well over 100 million deaths this century. The question is, what could we do if you're looking at a time scale of decades to avoid really big numbers of uh, deaths? Sir Petal, have and we? What happens mm. in the first year isn't the question. What happens over the next decade, the next few years, the next decade, the next 20 years? Well, these are the I've got a point. The, sir Petal, actually, there's been a good start. The, the question is, I have to ask you this question because it's very important that we are not only just talk about the plans, but rather the plans have they worked. For example, with the European Union, it has agreed two years ago with the anti-tobacco plan by all countries. And now, by May this year, only 11 out of 28 European countries managed to implement those plans agreed by the European Union. That's one example. The other thing is some states inside the United States have also exercised similar practices and policies. And yet we are also seeing challenges of implementing, not even mentioning meeting the deadlines. So uh, it seems that worldwide we are reaching a bottleneck, some suggest, of the next stage of uh, anti-tobacco drive. Uh, we understand the passions that all of you have because you are advocates of this cause. But the question is, how can we face this part of the reality? No, please look on an appropriate time scale. Ask what happens over the last 20 years in the European Union. Male deaths from smoking have gone down by half in the European Union. That is a very big success. You take the biggest cause of premature death in Europe in 1990, you reduce it by half. That is a big success, but that has taken place over a 20 year period. Now in China, you've still got tobacco deaths rising. And the question is, how can we get a big reduction in that 2 million deaths in 2030, in the 3 million deaths in 2050? All right. So what you're no, saying, this is what, this you're is saying, what we're going for. Uh, and Mr. on that Petal, time you scale, didn't answer success. My, my question, my question is, what you have done already congratulatable. But on the other hand, we have seen recent policies fail to meet its deadlines. Two years since the European Union they, gave up with, that, uh, come up with the, with the policies. Briefly from you, sir. No. On the whole, what is happening is success. It is slow but steady success. Right. I would like it to be faster, but there is success. We have halved the biggest mm -hmm. cause of death in Europe over the last 20 years. In Britain, over the last 40 years, it's gone down 
by a factor of four. It is now a quarter of what it was. Mm. This is success, but it is success over a long time scale. You're asking over much too short a time scale, and you're not seeing what will happen. 20 years ago in China, nothing okay. was happening. All right. Things are happening now. Looked at uh, retrospectively. Of course, uh, of course uh, what, what, what's going to happen in the future has a lot to do with whether we're going implementing things step by step uh, during the short and the middle term. Having said that, though, let's go to another question, which is what exactly are the interest groups that might be having an influence on the policies, on the eventual impact, uh, impact and also implementation of the policies? Uh, we take a look at the state uh, control the tobacco industry in China. China has been very much uh, self doing self-criticism about this over the past few years. It's been a major source of China's national revenue and providing millions of jobs for most of three decades. It has been contributing the most taxes among state-owned enterprises to national revenue. 2015 alone, the industry handed over one trillion yuan to public finance, a 20 percent increase from last year. Meanwhile, there are over 15 million tobacco farmers and over 6 million tobacco-related workers and retailers. Tobacco sales in China account for one-third of the world's total. Of course, that is a big issue for the world to, to eventually handle the question. So, Dr. Chang, come to, to you. Uh, China has already been trying to handle this problem, trying to raise the prices, the taxes for those tobacco industries and people understand it's not good to smoke. And yet the question is, it is an industry that would take a long time to disappear. So how much pragmatic expectation mm -hmm. shall we have going step by step with the policies that we have just mentioned, for example, uh, being described by Dr. Pratt? Well, let's tackle this uh, issue just mentioned earlier, the tobacco revenue. Uh, one of the uh, six uh, measures recommended by WHO is to reduce tobacco taxes. We all know through uh, our experiences watching what happened in, in the last decade and so, the revenue collected from tobacco sales would not compensate for the loss socially, economically, altogether. So it's not a uh, justifiable means to, uh, to, to get money get in the pocket of the, of the, of the government uh, mm -hmm. treasure. On the other hand, for example, if smokers quit smoking, they will spend uh, their expenses, uh, purchase the uh, cigarette to some other uh, activities. So it's actually a redistribution of revenue. It's not totally dis disappearing. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, uh, when you have uh, more than a million people died every year in China, mm -hmm. so many families are affected directly by itself. So we should not depend at all the revenue coming from tobacco sales. Instead, we should take every Quest every action possible mm. to reduce the tobacco sales, and that's the solution. That is certainly you know. well understood. However, there have been arguments, not only in China, but also elsewhere as well, with possibly coming from the interest groups, uh, uh, Dr. Pratt, that when you ban uh, this tobacco sales or raise the bar of tobacco sales to the young people, they might go to other means, even underground illegal means, uh, encouraging tobacco underground sales. Uh, all over the world, and therefore they say this is probably even the bigger crisis, as they argue. What do you make of this argument, briefly from you? Well, I'm, what I make of this argument is that this is one of the many myths and fears that gets peddled by the tobacco industry, trying to stop strong tobacco control policies, which we know and they know will work. Mm. Uh, but the, the, the good news is that evidence trumps uh, myths and fear every time. There's no evidence, no evidence at all, that strong tobacco control policies drive young people underground in search of illicit uh, cigarettes. There's no evidence at all. Mm. We know that if you put taxes up, if you put a ban on smoking in place, if you ban uh, tobacco marketing, people quit smoking. People stop smoking. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so this is just one of the many uh, uh, myths that's peddled by the tobacco industry, and it's right. just not true. And probably they won't even pick up smoking from the very beginning. Correct. Could and I, bef and before, I something yeah, that. Uh, before I, we go, I, 10 seconds for you, yeah. we leave uh, 20 seconds okay. for Dr. Petal. Okay, okay. Uh, China has re reviewed the uh, policy to ban smoking in public places. However, uh, people are suggesting that we allow the leaders to smoke in the private offices. We set up smoke-free uh, smoke sections within smoking areas. Right. These things has to be stopped completely because okay, and that's a bad thing to do. All right. And Sir Petal, I promise 20 seconds for you. <laughs> Thank you. Smoking kills, stopping works. People who are listening to this program can stop and save their own lives. 
from the point of view of tax, if you double the price of cigarettes, consumption will go down by a third and mm -hmm. the government will get more money, not less money. I do not think tobacco is going to disappear between now and 2030 or between now and 2050, but it can get less. And if you double the price, consumption will go down by a third and many, many right. tens of millions of lives will be saved.